exciting uh, session uh, on resilience leading for the long term. Uh, we are going to be taken through uh, this session uh, by Mike. Mike is, is somebody we well known to, to us. And uh, Mike, thank you so much for accepting the invitation from we, Women on Boots. Uh, it's important I introduce myself. I'm Eunice Kuria. Um, I'm a member at Women on Boats, and I serve in one of the committees for policy and advocacy. And I'm, 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 I'm looking forward to engage and moderate this session. So allow me to first uh, introduce Mike. I know most of us know him, but allow me to introduce him to us. Uh, Mike is a founder, chairman, and lead consultant of the Dan Eldon Place of Tomorrow, um, a management consultancy and focuses on leadership, strategy, culture, strengthening performance, management and coaching. He's also sought of after as a speaker and a writer on these and other topics. And, and that's why we've also approached him to speak uh, in this session. He is a chairman of the Council of KCA University and is a non-executive director of Occidental Insurance and of Davis and Shutlift, which is the water, which is in the water and energy sectors. He is a member of the advisory council of the African Institute of Policy Development, a think tank that supports the actualization of the demographic div dividend, and a co-founder of the Institute of Responsible Leadership, which was launched in London in October 2019. Mike is an economics graduate of University College London and a Sloan Fellowship of London Business School. He entered the IT field in 1967, arriving in Kenya in 1977 to become a general manager of a multinational computer company, ICL. And he has lived there ever since. He was a pioneer in the development of the use of IT in Kenya and was deeply involved in the development of Kenya's first national ICT policy. 15 years ago, he reinvented himself as a management, as a management consultant and his clients include public and private sector organizations, family businesses, NGOs, and the World Bank. He is a senior leadership advisor to the UN Institute of Training and Research and is an adjunct faculty member in the development and delivery of transformative leadership program for Aga Khan University Graduate School of Media and Communication in their joint initiative with the Harvard Kennedy School. He is a global leader of the World Bank Collaborative Leadership for Development Initiative and runs a high level workshop on leadership in Kenya and beyond, as well as being an executive coach. Mike has been chairman of the Council of Kenya Institute Management and he is a fellow of the Institute. He was, a, he was a founding director and vice chairman of Kenya Private Sector Alliance, uh, where he is now a member of the advisory council. And he is a founder member of the Management Consultants Association of Kenya. Since 2007, he has been writing the column, a column in Business Daily, having now published over 340 articles. And in 2009 book, um, and, in, and his 2009 book, Kenyans, Yes We Can, is a collection of his articles and speeches. Mike is married to Evelyn Mungai, the author of From Glass Ceilings to Open Skies, for which he was an editor. So Mike, welcome to the session. Uh, you're definitely the right person to take us through the resilience. You've been in leadership for long. We welcome you and I just welcome everyone into this session. Feel free to engage. Uh, Mike has asked to be interactive. His presentation is an interactive one. So you can either put up your hand or put any questions in the chat and we can, we can, we can, we can actually just, and he can answer the questions as we go along. So Mike, welcome and, and welcome to the session. Yes, Kathleen. Please allow, allow me to just say that uh, for this um, uh, session, Mike is actually joined by his lovely wife, Uni, um, sorry, <laughs> Evelyn. Evelyn. Okay. Uh, yeah. 
yeah and 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 Evelyn is not only an author but an entrepreneur who has done great things in the field of of um, uh, fashion and design. design she of the Evelyn College of Design so thank you Evelyn for joining us and she was with us right from the day we launched Women on Board. So we celebrate you, uh, Evelyn, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Eunice and thank Catherine. Thank you. And um, I'd like to first start by updating my bio because uh, the, the version you have is uh, a little bit out of date. I'm no longer the chairman of um, KCA University Council. Um, but by the way, the person who invited me to become the chairman was the chairman of the trustees of the council. Someone you may have come across, his name is Patrick Abath. And one of the main reasons I agreed to become the chairman was because of the person who invited me to do so. Patrick. Um, I've known Patrick for many years. And of course, we had a wonderful uh, talk from him this morning. I, I was so pleased to be able to uh, listen in on, on what Patrick had to say. I worked with Patrick in, in many environments, including Kepsap, where he was the chairman not too long ago in Rotary, where he was the district governor. Uh, and, um, and so here we are now. Um, with this wonderful collection of women, um, and, and, and not excluding my wife. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, um, I'm so happy about the way the dignity, the role of women has been strengthening in this country. When Catherine started this morning, you were telling us about how more and the higher and higher percentage of women on boards. Patrick, of course, won't be comfortable till it gets to 50%. Um, but the glass is filling. And it's not only filling in quantity, it's filling in quality. And women are rising at all levels. I've seen in Davis and Shirtliff, where I'm a director, that and it's largely engineers, it's hundreds of engineers dealing with water and energy. And when I first joined the board nearly 20 years ago, there were practically no women at all, and certainly not um, customer facing. But now there are more and more. And not only are there more and more, but they're rising up the organizational hierarchy so easily, so smoothly, with such good communication skills. Last week, uh, I ran my annual emotional intelligence workshops online. We had 200 people from around uh, the region, different countries as far as Zambia. And when it got to the interaction, to the questions and comments, it was almost exclusively from women. Uh, and I wasn't altogether surprised. I've been running change management program with Toyota, with all their staff around Kenya. Again, another technical company full of technicians, of engineers. And yet when I've been running those workshops for Toyota, again, the disproportionate number of contributions of thoughtful articulate contributions were coming from women. So great scope for optimism for the future of women in this country in leadership. Let me come to my topic of uh, resilience, of leading for the long term. It's um, something we've been hearing about from both our speakers, isn't it? The change the pace of change, the increasing pace of change. And so we need to be up for that. We know that um, we have to expand our horizon, which is the theme of this conference. And here's someone who is good at looking out 
and being resilient. Even in the days before COVID, Robinson Crusoe, and I came across this one that I couldn't resist sharing with you, a resilience consultant uh, who knew all about isolation pre-COVID. But moving swiftly along, the change that we see has been characterized since the late 1980s by the acronym VUCA. It's a VUCA world, people say. So what does VUCA stand for? It's these four words that you see there. Volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It was first applied in the context of the military environment by the US military at the time the Cold War was ending and life was becoming much more VUCA, but it then became applied to business, to all organizations, to government generally. And it is these kinds of characteristics that we're living with every day, even before COVID, never mind with COVID. So all this turbulence, this unpredictability, these connected elements, the lack of clarity, not able to have enough information we fear in order to make decisions, but having to make those decisions urgently and to adapt them. All this is the challenge of the days in which we are living. And yet, as we've been hearing from our two wonderful speakers this morning, some people are much more up for it than others. Certainly Patrick and Zainab are. Otherwise they wouldn't have reached where they have in their lives. And it's interesting that um, in 2017, some really smart characters came up with an alternative set of words whose first letters were V-U-C-A. Oh, now I don't know why my screen has got stuck. Hmm. My screen is stuck. I'm living in a VUCA world with my screen. Um, let me see as I um, hopefully have it get unstuck. Um, nothing is changing. Oh, here we go. So here's the first word. Instead of uh, volatile, we are asked to visualize and anticipate the future, to define a focus of where we're going and to redefine it, and then to understand, to look around, to gather data, to reflect and introspect. This type of reflectiveness is not least required at boards. And then these four C's, and there are many more C's, there are so many wonderful words that begin with C about communicating collaborating, having conversations, connecting with each other. That's been such a challenge in the days of COVID when we've not been able to meet physically like we're not meeting here now and where it's that much diff more difficult to interact. But here we do this communication and collaboration in ways that flatten the pyramid that's so much a necessity of the new environment not to have these steep pyramids with these big power gaps between levels for boards to empower management and for management to empower those at other levels cascading down so that people come together to live their visions and their values. And as we'll see in a minute more, to build these high trust relationships. 
And in order to do this, of course, we must have high emotional intelligence and social intelligence with a, with a high emotional quotient and social quotient. Much of my work revolves around helping people develop their EQ and their SQ, knowing that they are developable. But when you have technical people, whether it's engineers, accountants, whatever, they've tended, many of them, to neglect these skills, even doctors who are very good maybe at surgery, but not at the bedside manner. And finally, with the A, instead of anguishing only about ambiguity, to focus on adaptability, which of course also involves technology and the whole emphasis on innovation and on learning and growth that Zainab talked so much about. So we need to have AQ. What's AQ? Adaptability or agility quotient. That's vital. And for board members to possess it, to be role models for it, and to help nurture it around the whole organization. So we've got to keep calm, whether it's VUCA 1 or VUCA 2. And as the British say, with our stiff upper lips, keep calm and carry on. Did I sound like Prince Charles, who some people say I look like? Who knows? One of the things that I was so conscious of in organizations where I was a director and where I did my consulting is that those that went into COVID with all its VUCA challenges, VUCA one, with a healthy culture did so much better than the others. And Patrick talked a lot about this business of trusting remote workers, including in Australia. And when you have that trust, you're not in what's called presenteeism, which requires you to see the person at their desk. You trust that they will be working wherever they are, at whatever time of the day or night, in whatever continent of the world to deliver on what they're meant to be delivering. And where you have that healthy culture where people are engaged, they're recognized for their good work, whether there's COVID or no COVID, they keep going. And it's wonderful to see when that's present. And it's awful to see when it isn't. And it is because of this thing called trust. And you trust people because they are trustworthy. They have shown it, they do show it. It's not necessarily 100% of people, but the prevailing culture is a high trust culture. Patrick talked a lot about the significance of culture in this day and age. Um, sorry, I keep admitting people. I don't know why I'm the one admitting, but that time when I admitted it also admitted the next slide. Um, so uh, I, I think it's good for each of you to reflect on how your organizations that you're involved with came into COVID, how they dealt with COVID, how their culture was and is, and how it related to a high trust culture. Did COVID reinforce trust? Did it reinforce skepticism and mistrust? What have you been doing about it? Where's the board in all of this? Where are you as a woman board member in all of this? How do you nurture trustworthiness, earning the right to be trusted and therefore trusting? Because in societies like ours, which are not renowned for being the most high trust societies, there are too many people who believe that no one's trustworthy. Just some are better actors than others are pretending to be. But that's a very pessimistic view of human nature and absolutely not one I subscribe to. So here are some questions for you. 
and they arise from my experience in boards, never mind where I chair boards. And it's this question of where is your focus as a board generally, and as you, a director on the board? Are you too focused on just the last quarter and the next one, digging around rather than on the longer term? I've had to struggle over the years to help broaden, extend the time scales, particularly the forward looking strategic ones of boards on which I have sat. Are you too focused just on slashing costs? On getting rid of staff, a term I hate and ban where I'm involved? Rather than also or predominantly focusing on getting value, better value for money, increasing the productivity of your people. I see situations where some organizations, because the economy is in such difficult shape, have to grab sales at any price to keep the top line alive. However unsustainable those sales are, however high risk, however much one shouldn't be getting them. And how are you with your risk profile as a board and you? Are you at the center of the group? Are you towards the low risk end? Are you towards the reckless end? Which is your focus? Which is your board's focus in relation to these questions? And the final one that too many in family businesses, particularly where you have shareholders on the board and they're insufficiently distinguishing their role as shareholder from their role as director, are you too busy lusting after maximizing the next payout to the shareholder, even if it's a sub-optimization that mitigates against longer term sustainability. So these are, as I have reflected in preparation for this meeting, the big questions that boards need to consider, that individual directors need to consider. Are you in the right place? Where should you be moving? Or is this an affirmation that it is as it should be? And the whole idea is that as board members, you have to be not operational, but above the situation on the balcony looking in all these ways, as I list there. On the balcony, you look downward, you look outward, you look backward over history, forward into the future and not just the next quarter, and inward into yourself. Zainab talked a lot about that. Too many board members have not risen to this level. They're like ostriches. And this is a, a friend of mine from India who runs the um, Institute uh, for Kaizen, the Kaizen Institute, who came up with this uh, contrast between ostriches and albatrosses who soar and glide above, way above the balcony, and are able to look down in all these directions, forwards, backwards, outwards, inwards, etc. So as you look at yourself, where are you? Presumably you're not on the left, but are you sufficiently on the right? And some of you who will be chairpersons, chair ladies, are you bringing other people's heads out of the sand to rise onto the balcony and higher? So maybe let me, um, Oh, no, I just have one more um, just to reinforce this one about cost cutting. Um, 
I've seen organizations who've been brutal on cost cutting, on losing staff, downsizing. Yes, maybe one has to. And it's also therefore a question of how to do that in a humane way. But does it mess you up for the future? Because you have to rehire. A lot of companies are rehiring now. The whole cost of rehiring may be such that you now regret having let go of your people in the first place. Maybe they've gone on to do farming in Eldoret or something and they're no longer available or they've joined a competitor. And the whole idea just to reinforce is to increase uh, productivity. So let me pause there and ask Eunice to get you to share some of your reflections with each other, to, with yourselves to share them with us, Eunice. Sorry, thanks, 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 Mike. Um, my video is misbehaving, so you can't see me. Um, so we we open the session to any reflections. Anyone can put up their hands with any reflection. But uh, as as we wait for comments and uh, anyone with 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 to raise their hands, Mike, maybe I can start and just ask. With VUCA, we must be ready to unlearn. Um, please share an experience where you had to unlearn. Right? Hmm. Um, okay, well, let me go back um, into my early history in the IT industry, or what we called it at the time, because the term IT hadn't been coined yet, because I joined the IT industry in 1967. And when I came here in 1977 to run the subsidiary of this British computer multinational, we were selling mainframe computers, huge rooms full of air conditioned rooms full of these huge boxes with punch cards and huge printers. And then they were replaced by mini computers which were then replaced by PCs and everything changed. Now what changed for me as a non-technical person was not so much that I had to relearn the technology because that wasn't my scene anyway. I'm not a techie and I didn't have techie jobs in either software or hardware. But what I had to unlearn was the whole style and culture of dealing with a very small number of major customers with large computer departments to dealing with PCs as a commodity and to mixing the two. It was a very, very challenging un unlearning and relearning. And of course, <clears throat> that continues until today, doesn't it? In the IT world, in the ICT world, as we're talking now, Never mind the fourth re industrial revolution, the Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, all of that. People <clears throat> with technology and its consequences are constantly having to relearn, even up updating your operating system, getting the next version of Windows or whatever. There's unlearning and relearning to do. But when it's your whole life and you're in the ICT vendoring business, imagine those challenges. So that, that, that's a, a thought that occurs to me as you ask me that question. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, I think we can continue with your presentation, Mike. Oh, okay. Okay. We'll keep going then. Um, let me come on to Davis and Shirtliff again because I want to talk about this business of culture, which has at its basis, the values. We're not very good at talking about values in this country. We have values in our constitution. There are 17 of them tucked away somewhere in the constitution. But who refers to them? Who knows what they are? 
and with many organizations too these days of course everyone has to have values you have to be seen to have them on the website or whatever but do you live them and one of the reasons that people find this hard is because they have too many values davish and shirtliff only has three quality integrity and this altiora petto which was the motto of the high school to which alec davis uh, the chairman went and altiora petto means rise to higher level and that's such a nice thought and guides so much of what happens at, uh, at Davis and Shirtliff. And I talked earlier about this business of being selective about selling and being selective generally is all about knowing when to say no. And ethical companies with high values are much better at not giving in to temptation, not giving in to shortcuts, to easy way of getting a business. And we talk a lot about knowing when to say no at Davis and Chatliff. And it relates very much to having a purpose. Being in water and energy, it's rather easy for Davis and Shirtliff to define its purpose. It aligns so beautifully to the UN's sustainable development goals of having water for everyone, green energy. But it's serious, that's what they do. That, that's, that's their daily lives. And to improve people's lives by providing these solutions in, in water and, and energy. And it goes beyond that for Davis and Shirtliff. Alec Davis and all of us talk all the time about putting purpose before profit. It doesn't mean that we're not focused on profit because I think as Bob Collymore was very good at talking about in the context of Safaricom, it is increasingly possible, maybe it always has been, to do well by doing good. And if you do that, you will attract good customers, you will attract good staff, you will attract good suppliers, you will fit well into the communities where you work. And this question of purpose and values and culture has become rightly, increasingly mainstream at the board level. So I ask you again, is it the case in boards where you are generally? Are you one of those promoting this? This question of living your values, making them real, bringing them alive and of having purpose that doesn't take away from profits, but enables you to make profits in a sustainable way. It's not an easy thing, but it's doable. And I've seen it in practice in Davis and Shirtliff and elsewhere, including at Occidental Insurance, where by the way, just another update, I'm now the chairman there for the last uh, couple of years. We, we also are good at knowing when to say no, like no to selling an insurance policy by undercutting too much and thereby not being able to pay claims. We will not get that business, but we will get business where we are able to pay claims. So as I'm asked, and I'm sure this is the case with others like Patrick and Catherine and so many others here, to, uh, to join a board, one of the main things I will evaluate is the extent to which their values and cultures align with mine. And if they don't, I will not join their board. I will not. 
happily, there are many organizations in Kenya that are ethical, that don't take these shortcuts, that find it more difficult in many ways to do business, but they're much more sustainable. They attract much higher quality staff, customers, etc. And it's a pleasure to be associated with such organizations. I now want to get to another topic that I deal with so much in my consultant's life, but also as a director, this business of change management. And I want to share with you some books, some of which I'm sure you're familiar with, others may be less so, that relate to um, this change management. The first one, and the one you're most likely, I think, to have heard about, is Who Moved My Cheese? Where you have these two mice and these two little guys in a maze somewhere, and they're used to getting cheese and just going and collecting it. And then gradually, the existing freely available supplies start diminishing. And here you have Sniff who sniffs out the change early, and Scurry who immediately rushes off around the dark corridors to tr try and find new sources of cheese. But the two guys who find this very awkward and, and they're very change averse. Ho eventually uh, adapts when he, he sees that huh, it's that or bust, but Hem doesn't. He's still stuck. He can't handle it. And as the book Who Moved My Cheese ends, you wonder what happened to him? Did he just die? Did he starve? Well, there's a follow-up book that told us what happened. It's called Out of the Maze and tells us how he got out of the maze. And he did so by letting go of beliefs that held him back, that trapped him in the maze, that made him change averse. And he has this female person who introduced him not only to a different cheese or a different source of cheese, but to an apple. And then of course he got out of the maze and found all sorts of other food. But if you haven't read these two books, please do. They are fabulous. They are fables. They're short and easy to read. And they're so powerful, so powerful for you as board members and for you to share in a cascaded way to everyone in your organization. Almost the father of change management, of formal change management, is John Cotter, a professor at Harvard University. And he did this Eight Steps to Change serious book, which I also recommend you read. But he also did a fable on it called Our Iceberg is Melting, about this colony of penguins in the Antarctic. And you see those that jumble of statements, each one with a different view, some positive, some negative. But there's one of them, that top left penguin, who suddenly sees, probably due to climate change, that the iceberg is melting. But what do they do? How do they adapt? There's denial, there's lack of influence of him because he's just a techie who understands cracks. And this whole book is about how you develop the vision, you build a coalition of the willing, and you go through these eight stages to realize that you have to do something drastic. I won't reveal what they did. Get the book and find out, but get the book and read it and live what it offers in this very accessible way. Cotter did a follow-up book. That's not how we do it here. And this is about a meerkat colony in the Kalahari. It's a very successful one. It's quite large with very good systems and it works really well 
with organizational structures and controls and you name it until one day there's a disruption. Predators come flying in and grab their little ones and grab their food, but they lack the adaptability to set up urgent task forces to do something about it. And it's awful what happens. So there's this young emerging leader, guess what, a woman who tries to influence things and fails and she says, I, I can't live here anymore. I, I want to, I, I must find another meerkat colony, which she does. It's a small startup one, an agile one, and they deal with these predators beautifully. So beautifully that they start attracting more and more meerkats. Uh, that's fine, except that the bigger you get, the more systems and organizational structures you need, which they fail to do. Well, they also get into big problems. And again, the story evolves and I, I won't reveal how it comes together, but I just want to show you this wonderful uh, diagram of the best expression I've ever seen that contrasts leadership and management. So you see over here in the first colony, it was well run, but they were bureaucratic and unable to change. They were high on management and low on this leadership thing, which is all about helping people to be innovative, adaptive and energetic. And in a way to, to give away what happens in the end, how you bring these two together to have the systems and processes with guardrails, but large enough guardrails to empower people and enable them to be innovative and adaptive. And hence, what's the title of my talk? Resilient. These four books are absolutely wonderful. And I want to come on to, to the next book now, and my article about it uh, appears in tomorrow's Business Daily. And it's by this wonderful man, organizational behavioral professor, Adam Grant. I wrote about his book, Originals, about a year ago. And here now, um, I've got uh, this article about um, Think Again, his book. And so much of it, and you see that subtitle at the top, The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. And beyond being smart, he said, in a turbulent world, in a VUCA world, there's another set of skills of rethinking and unlearning. And Eunice, you were asking me what I unlearned. Um, Adam Grant writes beautifully about this book, uh, about it in this book. Because one of the biggest sins of board members in my decades of board experience is that board members don't know what they don't know, but imagine they do know it. And they will sit in a board meeting and wag their finger at a CEO or senior management to lecture them on what they should be doing and aren't doing and, and all the rest of it. And the management sits there tight-lipped, frustrated, but having to be respectful waiting till they finish with their pontification and ultimately says, but Mr. Stroke, Miss, Mrs. Director, we are doing that. It's just that the director didn't know what they didn't know. <laughs> and, and I smile when I, when I hear that. I, I'm in situations all the time when I do. Uh, I've run several board sessions aligning them with management recently where this became the central theme of helping board members to know what they don't know. And here um, Adam Grant quotes this knowledge is power that we know, but he adds knowing what we don't know is wisdom. And of course knowing what um, we don't know um, requires humility and, and we'll come back to that in a little while. 
more from Adam Grant's wonderful book. I just couldn't resist adding some more stuff. He says, it's okay to have conflict within a board, within an organization, but make sure it's task conflict and not relationship conflict. Make sure it's about what to do rather than who it's coming from and your personal chemistry and relationship with that person. And so you see the different zones, whether it's low task conflict or high, everyone in their comfort zone down there, bottom left, that's not good. But you don't want to be uh, toxic, of course, where you have high relationship conflict, but low task conflict. You don't want to be overwhelmed. You want to be in that high performance zone with low relationship conflict and high task diversity of views, including maybe from some women board members. That's a nice one for you to reflect on in your next board meeting as to how you do in terms of embracing a diversity of views without making them conflicts of building consensus and certainly without homing in on personalities that you're not too excited with. So this humble confidence is something that Adam Grant writes so well about, humble confidence. And he asks some nice questions about whether you suffer from confirmation bias. I think we've been hearing a lot about this. You're looking for evidence only that supports what you already think. A related one he introduced me to was desirability bias, where you seek evidence that supports what you want to see happen. And of course you have the I'm not bias bias, even though you may well be. He talks about other syndromes as well, that's worth making sure we're not part of. And it's part of this, uh, don't know what you don't know, the smug armchair critic. It's easy to be the critic up uh, on the stands, but if you're down there in the arena, Uhuru Kenyatta trying to deal with COVID or Biden or whoever, even Trump, um, make sure you're fully in the picture of what it's like to be in the arena. So you're not the smug armchair critic wagging your finger not knowing what you don't know. And there's this imposter syndrome. You know what the imposter syndrome is? That you feel you shouldn't be there. You're not really good enough to be on the board. Maybe it's because you're one of those youthful board members that's never been on a board, that's never been in the C-suite. But again, Adam Grant has some very interesting thoughts on the imposter syndrome. And he says it's not necessarily bad to feel you're part of the imposter syndrome because it makes you humble and it makes you seek out views from others, including people younger than yourself, people with less education, with whatever, people who are on the ground. These are terrific questions for board members because it's very easy for board members to lose their humility, more so the chair or the chair of a committee. To have this humility to not be in any of these situations, but not have the excess humility to feel that you're an imposter. Think again, Adam Grant. Lovely book. It's available here, but online too, of course. Another one of his thoughts is that we should think like scientists and not like these other characters, not like a preacher who is sermonizing in order to protect his ideals, even if, or her ideals, even if they hold people in the maze and protect them getting out of the maze, even if those ideals, those beliefs are not suitable. And we're not talking about religious preachers here necessarily, of course. And we have prosecutors, people who 
will always start their sentence with a but, particularly PhDs, I find, who are used to defending their theses or attacking someone else's thesis rather than bringing people together and building around them. So they prove the other person wrong and how smart they are that they've won over them. And their glory comes from seeing the defeat of someone else rather than from building consensus. And where's the chairperson in all of this to prevent such behavior? And let's not too, talk too much about politician, just read this morning's newspaper. But it's the third P that Adam Grant warns us against being, not least as a director, I repeat, to win over an audience, to be populist, to get the approval of supporters. And instead to be the scientist, where we keep testing what we believe as hypotheses and to be delighted if we find that there's a new way of looking at things that even replaces the old ways or even if it only just strengthens it. That is what agility is about. And I came across this wonderful uh, quote just as I was preparing this slide uh, from this chap who lived uh, in the 20th century, that a scientist is like a learned small boy. And that's uh, something of a scientist in every small boy, which he should keep hold of. Uh, you see my asterisk there, by the way. And even if I weren't talking to this group, I would have had the asterisk there to bring this to where it should be. A scientist is in a sense, a learned small child. So here's, <laughs> you can glance at this, if these slides will be distributed, you can see how Adam Grant sort of makes fun of the prosecutors and the politicians and the preachers in the way they behave and what they do and don't rely on what their background is relative to the scientist. So you need to have that scientist mindset uh, with the non-technical skills to accompany uh, what the evidence shows. And finally, on this topic, I must recommend another wonderful book to you. I talked about humble confidence, Ed Shine, he's over 90 now, he's an emeritus professor at MIT, beautiful books. He's the father of corporate culture, started writing about this in the 60s. My father, who, like Catherine and uh, Patrick, worked with Shell for, for, for many years, he actually met Edgar Shine because my father, just before he retired from Shell in the 1970s, was the head of worldwide management training for Shell. And... Uh, he learned so much and taught me so much in reflection of what Ed Schein uh, came up with. Uh, Ed, by the way, also, I, I uh, read an article by him from around that time, from, from uh, the, the 1960s, about young people wanting responsibility, want to be recognized. And you'd have really thought he was writing about millennials and uh, as I read about millennials and how they're so much this and so much that and so different, um, I know that we actually, when we were that age, young ones, we weren't so different as people make out we were. So humble inquiry, the gentle art of asking instead of telling, so you don't risk this business of not knowing what you don't know. Let me pause there again and um, hand over to my honorable moderator. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And um, um, I, I think for me, some of, some of the key things that has just come out is we need to be like scientists because scientists are always discovering, always learning, always wanting to experiment 
And I think as leaders, change is there. And if there's change, then we need to learn uh, as we go along and we need to experiment and make mistakes. Um, Lucy is saying she loves uh, minimizing relationship conflict. Go for task conflict. In other words, be objective. And, and, if, and I think for me, uh, based on just what you've taken us through, when you're ready to change as, as, as a leader, and I'll just ask this question as I welcome um, uh, hands to be raised or send any comments. When, when you're ready as a leader to change, because change is inevitable and we know that change will always be there. What happens if your leader or your board chair or some of the members in the board are not willing to change? How would you advise uh, a person who is ready to change? Do you leave that board? Do you leave the organization? Of course, that's not easy, Mike. Um, so maybe you could answer that as uh, we wait for more questions, Mike. Sorry, could you uh, repeat that question? Um, Eunice, please repeat the question. So I'm asking, um, change is inevitable and change will always be there. As a leader, I personally want to change, but probably the board chair or some of the board members are not ready for change. How do you deal with okay. that situation? Do I, do I leave the board? Do I leave the organization? How would you, how would you advise us to deal with, to, to its influence? Now I'll have to influence the change myself or some of yeah, us. Yeah, wonderful question. And it's interesting. I'm just coaching a, a senior leader from an international NGO uh, who's got this very challenge. And the part of the coaching is about how he should be maneuvering his way through the change without upsetting or uh, dealing, having to deal with the ire of this more change averse manager. And I had this experience when I came here in 1977, when I wanted to flatten the pyramid seriously. I came from the UK where the pyramid was already so much flatter than it was here. Here it was the mutual reinforcement of the colonial hierarchy and the age sets and the chauvinism and all that stuff. And um, for me, all that was anathema and ridiculous and uh, preventing performance. But my boss, my expatriate Mzungu boss, who uh, sat in the same office as me in Bruce House, he still wanted the traditional top-down approach to leadership the instruction giving, not trusting people, never mind that it was mere locals and all that sort of stuff. And so I decided I had to do this quietly on tiptoe so that much of what I was doing, he didn't know I was doing. But I was doing it like a conspiracy to do good despite not being allowed to. And I've had this experience more than once in my life, I assure you, several times, and I'm sure many people here have done so. And so you want to deliver results. You have your beliefs, you have your values, you have your leadership style, and <clears throat> you <clears throat> try and do what you can without offending the change of us, without upsetting the one who is so, who would feel so threatened by um, a change in the status quo. Hopefully you get the good results and you can show that what you did and he didn't know or she didn't know so much about what you did can be justified. It may not work, of course, because they will say, well, it had nothing to do with you wasting your time on, you know, um, <clears throat> empowerment and flattening workshops and stuff, change management, but you know it did. So you, you have to decide and um, ultimately either that person who is change averse will change their minds or they may be transferred and you'll get a better person to come in or you'll be promoted to that position or you leave and you go somewhere else if you're too stifled and it becomes too frustrating for you and those uh, around you. So uh, obviously there are no easy answers to this. A lot is to do with diplomacy, with emotional intelligence. 
but you are maybe less than likely to be the best messenger for change towards a manager who is your superior, presumably, who has their fixed ideas and that keeps them, according to you at any rate, in the maze, despite you trying to show them that their beliefs are inappropriate to this VUCA world. Thank you, Mike. And um, as we go along, I can see uh, Lucy is interested in knowing how much you charge for coaching. So leave your contacts. <laughs> you have a customer. <laughs> um, and then I, I will ask, uh, I think from what you've said, um, that also goes with values because you spoke about values. And if if the values you must, you said we must align um the board you're joining or the organization you're joining with your values i think that's that that mm, also mm. comes can answer the, the, the same question uh, as you've taken us through change if they're not willing to change i think then values are very key also because that comes along so there's another question um uh, hold on just one of this how much i charge for coaching i see it's from <laughs> lucy yes. Wairimo. can i suggest that uh, lucy gets my contact from the women on board secretariat so right. she and i can uh, can can discuss offline <laughs> thank you okay and by the way and of I'll... course I, i've been a, a mentor on the women on boards program um and uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to do thank you so lucy get in touch uh, with the secretariat and i'll allow umi to ask her question umi you can unmute and ask your question uh good afternoon my question is about uh, boards where maybe founder founding members have 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 had maybe a run in with the board and the board is is actually either forced to 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 show them the door uh maybe because they think the founders are are getting in the way of of doing business and i'm using the case of steve jobs at apple and good i think one. the founder yeah. of uber so how does the board navigate where this founder is, is, is top notch at what they do, but the rest of the dynamics are not working? Well, yeah, and it's not uncommon, is it, um, among family businesses particularly. And there is, just like we have the imposter syndrome, we have this thing called the founder syndrome, where the founder has come up with their skills, their preferences, their vision, their values, and the bigger the organization gets, sometimes the more inappropriate is their skill mix for leadership. Um, and so the question is how to, in a humane way, allow them the dignity of appreciating what they have built, their legacy that has brought the institution to where it is, and getting them still to make a contribution where they are suited, but without getting in the way of what's typically professionalizing, of bringing in systems, governance, all this stuff, professional managers, independent directors. In family owned businesses, this is what typically gets resisted more so with the older generation the founders or even the son these days of the founders, whilst the younger ones are coming in the third generation, perhaps, who've had more exposure, both here in Kenya and internationally, who have different ideas about human relations, about gender relations. And <clears throat> how do you bring all these talents together can you do it from within? Do you need to bring in a mediator? Is such a person the independent director? I must say that over the years, I have found that if you ask me what my role in life is, it's actually to be a mediator. It's energy alignment. And this is just one example of energy alignment. So that <clears throat> how do you have people exchange offers and requests 
so that each one gets enough of what they want and you build a consensus to move ahead to the adequate satisfaction of all parties. Now, if someone is like the person you're suggesting is adequately inter is so interfering with the organization that it's preventing it moving forward, preventing it being sustainable, you may need to take sterner actions, but there are many steps to take before you get there. And it's like I'm uh, been brought in to advise some family businesses. And because I'm old enough and I have enough white hairs, it's easier for me to talk to the mze and calm him down, it's usually a him, uh, and get him to relax and let go and empower the next generations that he can feel proud of, even as he feels proud of what he has built. So it's a bit like this boss, this manager who is change averse. It's like talking about the same thing in a way, isn't it? And <clears throat> it's all about this negotiating to win-win. That's what emotional intelligence basically is. It's negotiating to win-win. And you do that as a mediator, as a consensus builder, whether from within or as an external person or a halfway one, which is the independent director, to facilitate, to soften the situation, to lighten the atmosphere, to make people more amenable to give and take for mutual benefit so that it doesn't get to those final difficult firings, suings, and all the rest of it. And it's, it's why it's so good that in, in Kenya, we're seeing the increasing emergence of this what's called alternative dispute resolution of arbitration and mediation. And where those of us who are advocates of alternative dispute resolution are saying, no, it's, that's not any longer what should be called the alternative. The alternative should be going to the court and increasingly, particularly for small businesses, for family matters, this alternative is the first choice. And it often is a family issue, isn't it? This one of the founder uh, being a challenge. And how do we make that founder feel good and good enough to relax a bit, to keep on contributing where they can, using their network, using their skills, product development or whatever it is, and letting others be more empowered to get on with other aspects. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for answering that question. Um, Carlos is from tourism industry. We have had to apply VUCA2 to thrive and be resilient due to COVID impact, digitization, innovation, EQ was on top, of the list among others. And, and, and I think that's very true. Um, so Mike, I think I will, because of the next session that should be starting soon, I'll allow you to give us your final remarks Yeah. Uh, to enable us close this session uh, so that we can prepare for the next one. So let me allow you to give your final remarks. Uh, but maybe what I can do is just, um, Yes, mm -hmm. that was it. Just proceed. Then I will. I will. I yeah. will give the, the the announcement after that. Thank you. Okay. So some very quick headlines here: diversity and resilience. So you're a woman. So what? Is it, is it the important that you're a woman? Is your gender important? Are you there because you're a woman, despite being a woman? And I, I just want to say that in all the um, time I've I've uh, spent with uh, my wife Evelyn Mungai, we've been married for over a quarter of a century now. Uh, I've learned so much from her about the way she has progressed into leadership, neither because of nor despite being a woman. And this book, um, because uh, uh, this book that uh, we did together from glass ceilings to open skies is something you could uh, well read in order to help you with developing that mindset that we heard about in the first presentation by the keynote speaker this morning. And I think this is what I want to reinforce 
that feel good because you're a great person who happens to be a woman and who happens to have the, um, uh, cha the, the, the benefits and the strengths that you bring with your background. And, and I had these other questions that again, if um, the presentations are being shared, you can reflect further on. But this is my parting thought that um, you should keep reflecting as you obviously join this conference to do, to keep asking questions and to keep act interacting with this wonderful organization, Women on Boards Network. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mike. Um, I thank you also for the books you've given us uh, as, as you went along with your presentation uh, to be able to read more on this topic and just be resilient as we lead as leaders. And I think some of the things I picked up was be calm, we need to be calm. Uh, we need to know when to say no. And we need to know our purpose in life. I think that's very important and even as a leader. And as we lead, we need to bring the purpose first before profits, which is very key. Understand your purpose, your values and the culture and know where you fit in and go into boards and go into organizations that you know align with your values, uh, which is very important. And then as a leader, you need to be innovative, energetic and adaptive. And that's what you also need to lead your teams to be. And one thing I've picked, Mike, which I will go with, it is okay to feel you're an imposter, uh, in the, you're, you're in the imposter syndrome as a leader, because what that does to you, it humbles you as a person and it allows you to learn more and realize you're not know it all. And I think, allow me to close with a quote just on still on res being resilient. Uh, when we learn how to become resilient, we learn how to embrace the beautifully broad spectrum of the human experience. So it is part of us, it is part of life and re resilience brings change. And, and, and thank you so much, Mike, for taking us through this session. And thank you for always being there for women on boards. And, uh, and, and you said you're, you're one of our mentors. And we thank you so much for everyone else engaging in this session and looking forward to the next session. The next session is going to start at 1.30. And as, as we had advised in the previous session, you log out, then we log back in at 1.30. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. And thank you very much, afternoon. Eunice. And uh, goodbye from me and from Evelyn Mungai. And we wish you open skies beyond the glass ceilings. And like Evelyn, she never saw the glass ceiling. Is there one? Does there need to be one? Not if you don't maneuver through life in that self-confident, relaxed way, knowing what you're offering and what you can deliver. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good afternoon all. Bye-bye. Thank you.